I was forced to stay in a large room with other children from a neighboring plantation. I tried to run away, but I was caught. As punishment, they cut my feet. I had to work for weeks while my wounds healed. This moving testimony reminds us of a time long ago when slavery was prevalent. But these words are not a call from our past. They are found in the April 24, 2006 Forbes magazine. The words of an enslaved boy working in the cocoa fields of the country of Cote d'Ivoire, also known as the Ivory Coast. And he is not alone. UNICEF reports in February of 2006 that child trafficking is on the rise in this region. It may surprise you to learn that the chocolate bunnies you ate on Easter were likely tainted with child slavery. Despite the promises and agreements made in recent years by chocolate companies, they continue to use child labor in the production of their chocolate. We, as consumers, must communicate that this is unacceptable. To do so, we will first reveal the connection between chocolate and child slavery. Second, examine why the problem continues. And finally, discover just how much power we have in bringing child slavery to an end. Cocoa bean production is limited to areas near the equator, such as Central America, Indonesia, and the Ivory Coast. The International Cocoa Initiative website, last updated February 8, 2007, explains that with almost a million acres devoted to growing cocoa, the Ivory Coast accounts for more than 40% of world cocoa production. Because growing cocoa is labor intensive, and this is a significant part of the cost of production, the Vancouver Sun on November 10th, 2006, reports that many farmers in the Ivory Coast have turned to using forced child labor to cut costs. The conditions of these children are beyond comprehension. The International Cocoa Initiative details the hazards they face each day. They must work long hours in the fields in brutal conditions. They clear fields with machetes and apply pesticides without protective gear. After harvesting the cocoa pods, they must split them open with heavy knives. Once the beans are dried and bagged, they must carry these large loads long distances on their young backs. Even more alarming is just how many children are forced to live this life. The New York Times of October 26, 2006 reports that more than 200,000 children in the Ivory Coast are forced to work in the cocoa fields. The Chicago Tribune of May 5, 2006 reports that in contrast to the rest of the world, this region of Africa has the highest rate of child laborers. Of all children 5 to 14 years old, more than one in four are forced to work. Earth Save International, last updated February 14, 2007, says that these children are either enticed with promises of good wages and easy work, or outright kidnapped. One example is a boy named Malik, who came to the Ivory Coast at the age of 14. Despite the promises, he was never paid. When he asked to be paid, he was beaten. He had to scavenge for food, and at night was locked up with the other kids. The New York Times of October 29, 2006, says that almost 12,000 children in the Ivory Coast have been trafficked far from their families' homes and into slavery. In 2007, slavery should be a topic we only discuss in history class. Unfortunately, because our demand for chocolate continues, the Ivory Coast and chocolate companies have been willing to ignore the problem. Farmers in Ivory Coast invest in cocoa for its large profits. In order to maximize their gain, they cut costs by using the forced labor of children. These 600,000 farmers then turn to large export companies in the Ivory Coast to buy their cocoa. The New York Times of October 26, 2006 reports that these export companies are able to keep the price that they pay for cocoa low because they have so many farmers to choose from. The exporters then sell their cocoa to large chocolate companies, such as Hershey's, Nestle, M&M Mars, and Cadbury. The Calgary Herald of November 17, 2006 tells us that in 2001, almost all of the big chocolate companies signed the Harkin-Engel Protocol, agreeing that by 2005, 
they would certify that their chocolate was not tainted with child slavery. However, this deadline passed two years ago. But the company's making excuses, saying they need more time. But the September 20th, 2006 Seattle Post Intelligencer suggests that they're more concerned about the civil war on Ivory Coast interfering with their supply of cocoa. Clearly, the civil war is also top priority with the Ivory Coast government. The Associated Press on June 15th, 2006 explains that the government doesn't want to interfere with the supply of cocoa because export taxes are their primary source of revenue. The government uses this money to buy military arms and equipment. The Ivory Coast may not have blood diamonds, but certainly possesses blood chocolate. But ultimately, the blame rests on us, because consumer demand for chocolate keeps the industry insulated from pressure. The World Cocoa Foundation, last updated February 14, 2007, tells us that North America and Europe consume nearly two-thirds of all cocoa products, and that demand for confectionery products containing chocolate rises four to five percent each year. The sad truth is, most consumers are not aware of chocolate's connection to child slavery. Because we continue to buy their chocolate, the industry feels no urgency to change. Now that we understand the problem and why it continues, we must ask what we can do. And the answer is simple. We must stop buying slave-produced chocolate. But don't worry, I'm not suggesting that we stop buying chocolate altogether. There's an alternative, and it's called Fair Trade Chocolate. Transfer USA, a nonprofit organization, is the only independent third-party certifier of fair trade products in the US. It allows companies to display the fair trade certified label on products that meet strict standards. Some of these standards, found on their website last updated November 16, 2006, include a prohibition of forced child labor, safe working conditions, living wages, environmentally safe farming methods, a guaranteed minimum price, and direct trade between the farmers and chocolate companies, thus eliminating the manipulative exporters. If we as consumers change how we buy chocolate, the industry will have to respond. Currently, they're trying to distance themselves from the bad press associated with slave labor. And as a result, the Gelt Mercury, February 3, 2007, reports that some have begun to buy into the fair trade market. For example, Business Wire, October 11, 2006, reports that Ben & Jerry's is expanding its fair trade certified ice cream flavors. Forbes magazine, previously cited, says that fair trade has even made inroads into the Ivory Coast, but still accounts for only about 1% of cocoa exports. Economics teaches us that demand controls supply. They can only sell what we buy. A perfect example of this is the industry's response to the rising demand for organic food products. The Boston Herald on October 16, 2006, reports that Organic food sales have risen more than 15% in the last two years. With a multi-billion dollar market, the 2006 September 20th Sacramento Bee says that big companies like Walmart and Frito-Lay have made organic food mainstream. If we demand more fair trade chocolate, the industry will have to supply it. And when the chocolate companies start buying more slave-free cocoa, farmers on Ivory Coast will have to abandon slavery to keep their buyers. Today, we have exposed the connection between chocolate and child slavery, examined why the problem continues, and finally discovered how we can bring it to an end. The next time you go to buy chocolate, remember the words of a child quoted in the November 10, 2006 Toronto Star. When the rest of the world eats chocolate, they're eating my flesh. The Ivory Coast may be 7,000 miles away, but we have a responsibility to protect all children. Fair trade chocolate may cost us a little more money, but that's a small price to pay to free thousands of children from slavery.